Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming out tonight, despite the weather. Uh, my name is Annette Thompson, and I'm one of the board members of the GW Tech Alumni Group. And we're here this evening. This is our second career development event of the semester of this academic year. And tonight, we're going to be talking about keys to success, women's perspectives on careers in technology. So we've got a great lineup, a great panel of female executives from industry and government. And uh, we're looking forward to hear what they have to say. So let me go ahead and first uh, talk briefly about the GW Tech Alumni Group. Our group is about a year and a half old, and we were formed out of the School of Business, out of the ISTM department, graduates. But our arms are open wide. We get a lot of interest from folks who have other technical or even non-technical degrees from GW, and we welcome anyone's participation. Our mission is to increase the value of our GW graduates' education by establishing a professional network that furthers their careers in technology and management. Uh, we try to have events like these, round tables, and uh, more informal networking events. And um, coming up in January, we're having a luncheon event. So, And we're also tonight streaming online. Hello, and thank you to the folks who are joining us online, um, trying to reach folks who can't be here in person. Before we get started, I just want to say briefly special thanks to the GW ISTM staff and faculty. They've been really instrumental in helping us uh, organize these events and come up with great speakers. Um, the GW External Relations Videography team, thank you so much for helping us do the live online stream. We really appreciate it. Also, GW Academic Technologies. And finally, the School of Business Office of Alumni Relations, because we couldn't do any of this without them. So tonight's uh, discussion, our agenda is going to be uh, speaker presentations first. Each of our speakers will talk for about 10 or 15 minutes on their thoughts about their career in technology. And then we'll take a very short break. You can refresh your drinks, and we'll come back for Q&A and wrap it up. All right, let me do an introduction of our speakers. Our first speaker, Julie Barco, Germany. She's the vice president for digital strategy at DCI Group. Julie's focus is on studying the ways in which technology, politics, and governance, and civil society evolve together. Uh, in addition to serving as VP for digital strategy at DCI, she recently co-founded the M Citizen Summit and served as the chairperson for the annual Campaign Tech Conference. Previously, she served uh, here at GW as the director of the Institute for Politics, Democracy, and the Internet, and also the director of marketing and communications for the GW Graduate School of Political Management. Julie is a, the author and editor and co-author of several publications, which were too numerous to list here, uh, but there were several. And she's appeared uh, in national and international uh, publications, TV, etc. cetera. Uh, Julie's background is in literature, philosophy, and classics, degree from Messiah College, and also an MA from GW, where she was a fellow. Our next speaker is Dr. Katrina Purvis. Uh, Dr. Katrina Purvis uh, is the CIO for Nestis, right, which is the National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service, which is part of the Department of Commerce serving the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, you may know as NOAA. Uh, Dr. Purvis is also an attorney barred in the state of Maryland and a U.S. Air Force veteran. She has 15 years of agency experience in IT architecture, security systems development, acquisitions, operations and maintenance, and program management. Uh, Dr. Purvis holds a bachelor's degree from Southern Illinois University, dual master's degree in acquisitions and procurement, and a computer information resources degree from Webster University in St. Louis, and a JD with a technology law emphasis from George Mason Law School. Our next speaker is Peggy Winneman, who's a senior consultant with Infinitiv. Uh, Peggy is described as a leader with 25 years of proven success in information technology, the internet, managed security services, financial services, and telecommunication. Most recently, Peggy served as the director for governance, risk, and controls, and director of program management at Fannie Mae. Previously, she was senior vice president of operations at NETSEC, vice president for internet and global standards at Cable and Wireless Global, Director of Operations and Product Delivery at Promontory Interfinancial Network and has also held other senior technical positions. Peggy holds an MBA from George Mason and a Certificate in International Economy, Technology, and Industry Studies from Oxford University. 
And lastly, uh, our last speaker is Alexa Kim, who's the Assistant Vice President of Client Relationship Management at the University of Maryland University College. Alexa is responsible for the PeopleSoft division and for building the new client relationship management and communications discipline within the IT organization, which is the largest public university in the United States. Prior to joining UMUC in 2010, Alexa served in a series of IT leadership positions here at GW. Over her career as Alexa has sought to capitalize on the intersections between technology, communication, customers, and organizational growth and change. Alexa holds an MA from Vassar College in History and France, French, an MA from GW in Telecommunications, the Carnegie Mellon CIO Institute Certificate, and the Wharton School Certificate of Professional Development and Management. This year, she also completed the Georgetown University ICF Certified Leadership Coaching for Organizational Change Program and is building her leadership coaching practice. Currently, she's in progress as an, as an executive scholar at the Kellogg School of Management. So without further ado, I'd like to kick it off um, to our first speaker, Julie Germany. Thank you. I really like to joke that what I do is soft tech, not hard tech. I don't necessarily build things, but I manage a digital public affairs team that pulls together dozens of different digital tactics on behalf of our clients. And those digital tactics might include online advertising, they might include social um, media outreach, blogger outreach, website design and development. So a bunch of different smaller things all pulled together in one larger comprehensive strategy that either gets constituents and voters to take an action on an issue or attempts to influence the media or elected officials or regulatory agencies to create some kind of policy change. And you can tell from my background in lit philosophy and classics that technology might not seem like a really good fit for me. I became interested in technology in graduate school and it was because of my love of literature that I started to look at technology as something that I wanted to do for a living. I was a huge fan of cyberpunk and of William Gibson and when I was in grad school I read a book that came out right around that time called Pattern Recognition that really influenced what I wanted to do for a living which is figure out how to use patterns and how people communicate online visually but also in an interactive way to figure out how to influence people and change minds and that's what I do today. I spend most of my time as a woman, as a leader of my division, trying to figure out how to get my team to do what I call good public affairs strategy. There are tons of stories and publications like Ad Week and Media Post about um, companies and advocacy groups who throw something up on Twitter or throw something up on Facebook and the tool becomes the story rather than the client. And a lot of people become distracted by what I like to call shiny object syndrome, which is if there's a new app for that, then I want it and I want to use it, regardless of whether or not it will help meet our goals on behalf of our client. So a huge focus of mine is how do you use all of these really cool, interesting ways of communicating with each other, of getting people to take an action, of persuading people, of influencing public opinion, but more importantly, influencing influencer opinion using technology. And what I found is that really good digital strategy can't be separated from real world relationships from good communication skills, but also from really compelling content. So all of the basic things that my non-digital counterparts do for a living are vitally important to my recommendations as a digital strategist and the way that I lead my team to solve problems. Um, and I actually lead my team through a problem solving process that I picked up on at the US Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. I was lucky enough a few years ago to attend something called National Security Studies Week where they take a small group of civilians and embed them with um, senior military officers who are taking the Army War College's one-year residential program. And you spend the whole week talking with them about policy, about the military, and about military strategy. And one of the students, a colonel, 
um, in my seminar during NSS week told me that the thought process he goes through when he's in a crisis situation is, what do I know? What do I not know? And then of the many different possibilities of what I can do, what is it that I should do? And that's the same process that I try to walk my team through at DCI Group when we're trying to pull together all these dozens of really cool, really trendy, really interesting digital tactics on behalf of our client. But I'd say that the larger battle for me as a woman and as a leader of this division is getting people in the mental game. And getting people in the mental game I think applies regardless of whether you're a female or a male. When I was in college, one of my friends told me that she thought most personality flaws were the result of a lack of confidence and um, were the result of insecurity. And I actually think that's relatively true in the professional world as well. A lot of bad decision making and a lot of bad behavior in the professional world is the result of a lack of confidence and a high amount of insecurity. So working with my team to recognize when you see an element of insecurity in the room, figuring out what it is, and then reassuring people and communicating to them the right way that you can use interesting and new and yes they do cost money digital tactics in order to create some kind of ideological change or policy change or cultural change on behalf of our clients and digital gets a lot of attention because it's fun and new and everybody's on Facebook and Twitter and we all like to use mobile apps and we do online shopping but at the end of the day it's been incredibly difficult to build the digital public affairs, digital politics profession. So I spend a lot of my, my free time focusing on how I can build up other people who do what I do for a living. How can we train ourselves to think in a more sophisticated way, to make recommendations that are more strategic and less reactionary to our clients? And then how do we sell those bigger ideas at the client level? I still see very much a disconnect, perhaps a lack of education between what we know is a digital profession and what our clients think is right for them. So working with other people who do what I do for a living, not to sell our clients on a tactic or a tool, but to get them to understand really what's going on, what's the trend, what's the pattern, and then trying to figure out whether or not it's useful for them. Um, and, and these are concepts that I think transcend gender, understanding your, your colleagues, working to meet and exceed expectations, and then figuring out how to be an advocate for what you know is right and communicating those strategic suggestions in the right way. Thanks, Julie. Uh, my name again is Katrina Purvis. I'd like to share with you um, two perspectives. Uh, the first perspective is consistent with, I think, why we're here today, and that's uh, career tips for being successful as a woman in IT. I'll share with you my concepts, you know, some tips I've used, and then I'd like to transition for a moment to uh, trends in IT that I think uh, shape uh, the next generation of the IT workforce. So sort of give you some, some IT, some really specific tips about things you might focus on to govern your class selection or uh, whichever field you choose to go into. So first of all, those concepts I've used uh, throughout my career, s serving as chief information officer uh, for a federal agency, uh, the, the satellite and information service for the Department of Commerce under the age of 40, a member of the senior executive service, an attorney, a veteran, um, Wow, I, I, I feel like I've had five lives, and how did I get there? First of all, I always question. I question the way we do things today. So, so uh, I shared with my husband, I've got three Qs and one C. Okay, those are the tips for, for how I chart, charted my career. Question the way we do things today, that's the first Q. Uh, never settle for just because that's always the way we've done it. Uh, we must continue, we must not, uh, change the way we do business, that, that's the wrong answer for today for a number of reasons. Secondly, qualify. 
who cares what you think if you say that you know that's the wrong way we, we must change you've got to qualify yourself take the right classes get the right certs uh, pursue the right academic um, uh, achievements so, so so question qualify and then uh, finally quantify quantify if you don't think we're doing things uh, smartly today if we're not innovating enough then uh, quantify how your ideas and suggestions uh, add value. Uh, you will get nowhere as a woman or male for that matter in, uh, in the IT career field unless you can offer solutions that have measurable, identifiable, and auditable value to your business uh, if you're in industry and to the mission if you're a public sector IT professional. So question, qualify yourself, quantify your ideas, quanti quantify the, 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 the value of solutions you might propose, and then finally care. Find something you care about. Find something that touches you, and I know it's kind of sappy because we all want to make a little money too, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we like to eat and pay our bills, but, but care about what it is that, that you choose to do. So my career is pretty diverse, right? What I care about is human rights. What I care about is standing up for the little man. So I pursued uh, a JD degree. I wanted to be an attorney. I wanted to know what my rights were. Um, now my emphasis is in technology law. I think there's certain, certainly an intersection, more so today than at any time, between IT and human rights, right? When we look at social media and some of the trends that are affecting uh, um, international affairs, for that matter. So I care uh, about what I do. Um, and I found the right synergy, I think, the nexus between IT and, and my concern for protecting human rights. So, so th those are my tips. Those are things that have led me in terms of my pursuits, my academic pursuits, right? I question, I qualify myself. If there's something I'm concerned about, then I go get smart on it. I learn about it so that I can add value and quantify that value. And then I make sure it's something I care about because if I don't care about it, then I'm not going to do it for very long. And that's not going to come across. So in terms of tips for women or men in, 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 in terms of how to be successful in IT, I think the next generation uh, IT workforce uh, has got to be smart about how we uh, deploy or leverage new technologies. And to be very specific, social media. I think the introduction of social media has had a profound and significant impact on uh, the way we do business both in industry and in the public sector. It created this whole new environment where you can reach uh, anyone at any time and you can gather folks and get your message either about your product out there or about your mission uh, when you care. When you care, you want to get that message out there. So we've got to figure out ways to introduce that into our, our, our systems and our infrastructure in a way that uh, adds value to our mission. But it brings about um, some challenges as well as opportunities. Opening some of those ports so that there's internet connection, especially uh, for federal agencies, is pretty hard to swallow. We've got to make sure we do it in a secure manner, in a manner that protects our assets. So social media, I think. Uh, the next generation workforce will have to be smart on. So know it, know it well, know how to take advantage of it, know how to uh, conduct your business using social media in a secure manner. Uh, next is mobile computing. My God, we are entering an, uh, a post-desktop PC era where folks need to be connected from anywhere at any time using any device. And they're not even using devices that we've issued, right, because usually we would control it. Right, we'd give you this device, I'd lock it down, you can't download any, uh, any application you want it. But now, uh, with the introduction of smartphones and iPads, I've got to figure out a way to leverage that new technology in my IT uh, environment uh, in a secure manner, one that adds value to the mission. Uh, so social media, get smart on that. Get smart on uh, uh, how to safely deploy mobile computing devices uh, and businesses uh, will want you. Uh, finally, cloud computing. What does that mean, right? Cloud computing. If you don't know, then uh, please get smart on it. Uh, we are in a budget environment. 
uh, that requires us to rethink whether or not we need to own the assets uh, that we use to support our, our mission systems. We got to start thinking about computing environments as a service and not as, not as something we buy, not as an asset because guess what, I can't afford it anymore. I can't afford to buy uh, dozens of data centers. I got to start con consolidating. I got to start uh, virtual virtualizing, and uh, using uh, what industry can provide by way of resource sharing. So get smart on cloud computing. Get smart on uh, mobile computing. Get smart on social media. And businesses, as well, well as the federal government, I think will want you, and you will be able to assist uh, your senior executives in meeting their mission. Make sure you know how to add value how to have positive effect on the bottom line, because that's the climate we're in, both in industry and in the federal government. Shrinking budgets, growing missions, growing cyber threats, and we've got to figure out how to use technology uh, to overcome those challenges. And so that's what I face. Uh, I have to make sure that we're making smart investments in my organization. That I've got a, a, a smart IT investment strategy uh, and a secure IT architecture. And so that's what I hope the next generation IT workforce will bring to bear. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Peggy Wenneman again, and thank you for having me here today. I thought I would tell you a little bit about my broad experience in technology. I've been in the field actually for 35 years and uh, I started, of course, at age 10. And, <laughs> and in the past, um, let's see if I can click this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I thought I'd go with the theme of past, uh, present, and future. Uh, in the past, I started out uh, in the era of mainframe computers that took up a whole room and only um, had 32K of memory on them. So. Uh, back in the day of punch cards, is if you don't recognize the picture there under the landline antique phone. Um, so I've come a long way, and we've come a long way in technology, the changes that I've seen and have had to deal with. Um, when I started out many years ago, um, there, it was predominantly a male-oriented field. Uh, when I started, there were no degrees in technology. So you, you went to a trade school, you went to computer school and you learned on-the-job training. Well, the good news over the years is that now there are degrees and advanced degrees in technology and it's branched out so much so. And now we look at our phones and we have as many applications on our phones that um, used to fill an entire computer room, and then some, uh, at, at the touch of our hands. Uh, we have a gig on a, on a thumb drive that you can download files and take pictures. We have cameras that take one and two meg pictures, individual pictures, right? So the advances in the, that I've seen in the, in the many years have, um, have really been astronomical. And what I would advise and what's worked for me is to keep current with your technology and you need to constantly learn and find out what interests you and then get certified keep up with your, um, your courses, your certifications, your degrees, whatever it takes. Um, over the years, I, my career has also evolved along with technology. I started as a programmer, I became a database administrator, I did systems analysis, and then I went into management. And so a lot of my advice is how to deal with people and collaborate and network and that type of thing. Um, we don't know what the future is gonna be. Uh, my daughter, high school daughter came home uh, from school recently and told me that in 2020, when she'll be competing for a lot of jobs, 50% of the jobs that she'll be competing for don't even exist today. And also, about that time frame, there will be 123 million professional, highly skilled jobs in, in the job market here in the United States, but only 50 million American applicants who are qualified for those jobs. Now that may sound like a, a good switch over today's um, high unemployment rate, you know, that there's more demand for jobs than are qualified candidates. But I think we need to be really focused on in, ensuring that we keep up with technology and that we not fall behind and, with other countries, right, in the job market. Um, 
So, so having said that and having a lot of different jobs that I've had in technology over the years, uh, it, I've had an exciting and challenging career and I have to say it's been interesting all along the way because as new technology comes about and you learn new things, it's always a, a new puzzle, a new, a new interest to me, something that keeps me wanting to learn and stay on top of, of um, technology. Um, oops, wrong way. Okay, so my tips that I came up with. And the first one, take up golf. And I say that tongue in cheek, but actually it's not a bad idea. And as I mentioned, there are a lot of men in technology still. Um, and I see it evening out a lot at certain levels, but definitely at the executive levels, still more, m many more men than women. And I think, um, uh, I know it was a frustration for me, back around 2000, I was a vice president of Cable and Wireless, which is a global company, but it's owned um, by the, in the UK, parent companies in the UK. And uh, I would get very frustrated on a Friday afternoon when many of my male colleagues would disappear for the afternoon and usually a client was taking them out to golf. And something that I'd be back at the office working hard to come up with the best decision on a new product, a new vendor that we should make a deal with or whatever, and be told on Monday that, um, oh, we've made the decision already. And that decision was made on the golf course. So I decided to take up golf at that point and I have enjoyed it ever since. But I can tell you that some decisions are made on the golf course. And it's, so it's not a bad thing um, to take up golf uh, or find some other way to break, that, break down that barrier of the good old boys network. And, and I think we should actually start a good old girls network. <laughs> so I advocate that as well. Uh, my next tip is on network. And of course, in real estate, people say uh, the three most important things are location, location, location. I say network, network, network. And I think... Um, in doing that, you open many doors for yourself. You'll learn more about what technology can do to support the business. And in many times, and especially in private industry, technology is really just a support agency or support arm of the company. And really the business is about something else. And you really need to understand your counterparts, your peers, uh, what it is that they're doing for a business. What keeps them awake at night? What gives them the most pain? And when you understand what, what those things are, then you can come up with a solution that might satisfy those problems. And it's really all about uh, solving problems and the most efficient and effective way possible. So, um, so the next uh, item I have is sharpen your collaboration skills. Work with people in other departments, reach out to them. Uh, take time, take somebody to lunch, buy them an extra Starbucks when you pick up yours. You know. Uh, it's learning more about the business and collaborating with other organizations that will help to make you more effective at your job and understand more what the needs and, and the requirements are. Um, re recently, I worked on a project with peers from across a, a broad organization on software license management. And the company was paying a tremendous amount of money in software licenses every year not realizing that every time a contractor left the company, an employee left the company, their laptops would be wiped clean, re-imaged, um, and then new software would be added on. And the department, not knowing that we'd already purchased licenses for someone who just left, would buy new licenses. So it took a, collaboration, a collaborative effort with human resources, procurement, legal, um, business units, IT organization, and by working together diligently, we came up with a process that identified how to reuse those licenses, how to renegotiate for new licenses, how to, um, to actually just manage them across the board. We were able to, to document that we saved the company $2 million within a, uh, a, year, a year's time. Now, that's a big savings, and that's money that would have just been you know, written off by each department independently. So being collaborative, you not only have a bigger win for the company, but again, it opens up doors for you. It opens up a, a networking opportunity as well. Um, I say hire the brightest and diversified group. Of course, we want to hire the brightest people. I'll add to that, don't hire a clone of yourself. You want to hire somebody who will challenge you, 
who will think differently than you do so that when that problem comes up that you're trying to address or that crisis comes up, you have people thinking from different perspectives and different angles. So I always find that a diversified group brings more to the table because people think in different ways and that's men and women and different cultures, et cetera. And the next piece of advice is be your own advocate. I think this is one area where women maybe uh, fall a little short, shorter than men. We tend to be humble and not brag about our successes and our accomplishments. Uh, when it, maybe when it comes around to annual performance reviews, we'll speak up a little bit, but only when asked to. And I think you need to have elevators, the elevator speech is what I call it, the one minute speech that if you step on the elevator with your CEO or your CIO or senior VP, you have something good to say about what you're working on and, and uh, some visible project, something that you're contributing to the company. Uh, don't be afraid to brag. Don't be afraid to toot your own horn. We need to do that as women. And I, probably the guys need to do it too, but I think they're already doing that pretty well. Um, always mentor a successor. I found that uh, if you have someone who can step in for you at any given moment, then it's a lot easier for you to step off onto another urgent, critical um, opportunity. So a lot of opportunities will open uh, if you're able to, to step up and help and step into that. So I also um, tell folks, if you can't be replaced, you can't be promoted. So always have someone next in line and um, mentor that folks. Um, the other thing is to, when, when I think about mentoring someone, many people manage down you need to manage down, up, mm -hmm. and sideways. So you need to manage your, your team if you have them, uh, give them direction, and then let them go off and do uh, what they do best. That's what you hired them to do, right? So give them clear direction, but not micromanage. Manage up, uh, manage the expectations to, uh, to upper management, to executives, of what it is that you're doing for the company and for them to make them look good. And of course, your team's going to make you look good, and you're going to make the company do well and succeed. And then manage sideways, that's more of the collaborative mm -hmm. effort. And my last piece of advice is to listen to your gut. Now, there's, sometimes you'll come across a situation where your brain's telling you to do one thing, but your gut has that nagging feeling inside, something just doesn't feel right about this. Something doesn't feel right about this candidate I'm about to hire, this decision, whatever it is. And in my experience, I've found that always trust your gut. There's something there. Maybe you can't put your finger on it, but you'll find out later that was the right decision. So those are things that have worked for me. I hope they'll work for you as well. And thank you again. Thank you. Do I just click through? Yeah. Great. Very hard acts to follow. Um, right, let me just click through. Um, so I've been dying to use this slide. Thank you so much for putting the punch card up, um, because you know, it, you know, basically 1983. I was 11 years old. The Apple IIe came out. Need I say more? Um, this is really how I entered technology. Uh, my mother uh, was a Montessori educator, and she came home one day with an Apple poster, and you know, because Apple was big in K through 12 and had educational discounts, and she bought me an Apple IIe, which ended up I, I have had a very close personal relationship uh, with that computer, and I, I remember feeling the the wow, you know, not only seeing that poster but just like having my computer, and this is even pre-internet, um, you know. So of course, you know, Steve Jobs is brilliant. I you know I spent hours on this thing, and I just I'm a big user and consumer you know, of technology, and that's really where I come, you know, into technology. Um, I remember senior year in college, uh, bef you know, kind of pre-web, pre I, I don't know when, when, you know, I forget when the um, first Mozilla browser came out, uh, but the, there, there were very serious uh, lectures on hypertext and what hypertext was going to do to the future of reading, you know, et cetera. Um, uh, right after college, I went into Peace Corps, and I remember, you know, sitting in my little hut, reading my uh, shipped in New Yorker articles, and I remember reading this profile on John Malone, who was uh, the head of TCI, and this was like, you know, this was in 90, uh, 93, 90, 93, early 94, and I just could 
feel it moving, like the industry and what was happening. And I just kind of felt, again, that pull uh, towards technology. When I came back to the States, uh, I landed at GW. I did my master's uh, in telecommunications, graduated in 1999. I was working full time and did my uh, master's uh, part time. It focused on the development of the internet uh, post Telecommunications Act of 1996. So it was just really, you know, you know, I remember one of the papers I did was on micropayments and you know the feasibility of that. You know, so it's just there's so much happens so quickly. Um, you know, so so that's kind of that's kind of my history. Uh, with technology. Um, skip forward to uh, 2011. I work at University of Maryland University College, uh, which as Annette mentioned is the largest public university um, in the United States. I'll just put a plug in here for our cybersecurity program, which is one of our cornerstone amazing programs. We don't have enough uh, professionals in this country to fill the cybersecurity needs and the jobs that are available. So it's one of our premier uh, programs. It's a we offer um, two different masters, one in policy and one is an MS, uh, you know, but that just echoes some of the points that uh, my fellow speakers were making. I work in the IT division. Um, I'm responsible for client relationship management, which we're starting up. Uh, also communications. Uh, I was just talking to Julie as well. One of the most uh, interesting things that I'm involved in is the uh, first phased rollout of social enterprise software, basically Facebook for internal usage. Um, so we're having a lot of fun with that. Um, I'm also involved in our ERP um, managing our ERP. We have a PeopleSoft implementation and it's very interesting being involved in that and seeing how SaaS Software as a service, cloud computing is changing the industry. Um, you know, so I totally agree with you know all of the points uh, that were also shared. I work on leadership, people, culture, processes are big, and I also just work on coaching people uh, because you know managing people and managing projects and managing very. Uh, difficult, expensive, tight time frame, interdependent technology projects, you'd be surprised at how manual it is, you know, in terms of coaching people through issues, getting people to communicate with each other, getting on the same page, making sure people are on the same, same page and have the same goal and that we remember that. Um, actually, you know, I put that, the goal is to, I, I use that so often uh, in my daily work, just reminding people, okay, the goal here is to do X, right? We're all here for that, right? And you know, you'd be surprised how many people kind of need encouragement, you know, to uh, to think like that, you know. And and they might know it, but they're getting lost in you know the issues. And I have no problem with details, um, but sometimes people just need to be reminded, you know, here what we're here for, what the goal is. Um, I, you know, on the bottom is just a lot of the language that I use every day in terms of, okay, how do we get to the goal together? I hear what you're saying, understood. How can we, what about, what do you think? <laughs> One of my most common things in email is WDYT, you know, question mark. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? You know, because it promotes that collaborative and, um, you know, prevents the, the calcification of silos, you know, so you always have to um, encourage collaboration you know, because I think people, a lot of people think, you know, that technology should just work, right? But it's a very, <laughs> it actually just doesn't work like that. Um, and especially in implementations or in procurements or just in, you know, getting to that, there's just a lot of people and a lot of process. So, you know, I talk to my staff, you know, or even people, you know, up, across, and down, you know, what's on your mind? Well, what do you think the issues are? How can I help you? Well, what about, what did, you know, if we thought of this? Um, I do email, face-to-face, -face, documents, you know, use the social enterprise tool, I text, you know, so really try to figure out how whoever I'm communicating with um, prefers to be communicated with. And actually, uh, my CIO uh, prefers text, you know, which is totally, you know, fine. So, you know, it's actually better than having to call him at 6 in the morning to tell him that, you know, I've just noticed mail is down. Um, I can just text him, you know, which is actually better for me. 
Um, I don't know if uh, uh, any of you heard of Guy Kawasaki. He's a former Apple evangelist, you know, interesting guy. Um, he's written a book called Enchantment, and uh, I've really enjoyed some of his presentations, and he has tips on presentations. One of them includes, like, you know, here's a top ten list. You know, so my top ten list, you know, is going to echo a lot of what my fellow speakers have said. So here's, and I'll dive into it. I have a slide on each. You know, know your own, know your commitment. Be on your own traje trajectory or just be your own trajectory. Uh, educate yourself. Embrace impermanence. Communicate. Know your moral compass. Build your networks. Network, network, network. Know your environment. Be, not just do. And be willing to know yourself. Um, you know, the, the, the adverse conditions that come with technology, projects, implementations, these high dollar, very fast changing, you know, projects. The industry has changed so quickly. Budgets change quickly. Priorities change quickly. You know, you really have to have, you have to care, you know, because you have to have a stomach for it. You really do. Um, to kind of get through every day. I mean, there have been some, you know, projects or phases where sometimes I wake up and I'm like, I cannot get dressed. I cannot do this. You know, but you get dressed, you go and do it that day, and you just get better. You know, every, every day is just another kind of nail in the wall that you're trying to scale up. Not every day is like that. So, um, you know, know your commitment kind of goes towards uh, what do you care about? Right, because you gotta care if you're gonna do it every day. Yeah, you know, you're you're there. You gotta care. Um, you know, so kind of thinking about this, and you know, I've gone through different phases. What is my commitment? You know, so my commitment is to I enjoy doing. I feel most alive when you know. I think many of you have heard of the I'm, I can't pronounce his name, but the the Czech author who wrote Flow. Um, uh, you know, so when you're in that state of being where you're doing something that you're really engaged in and, and time doesn't, you, you don't even notice the passing of time because you're just so engaged in that. And that's just a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Um, I am most satisfied when, I love it when people, I hate it when people, I don't notice time passing when. You know, it's kind of, this is kind of like the why are you here, you know, answer and not, you know, you know, why am I not just surfing in Hawaii? You know, why am I not in a shack in Costa Rica? You know, just watching the surf go. You have to really know why you are where you are. Um, and for me, I, I enjoy, love leadership, um, and I love people, and I love technology. You know, so I try to find those intersections, and that is where my commitment is. So... Uh, be your own trajectory or be on your own trajectory. Um, you just, that's something you have to do. You know, you, uh, you know, things come and go. You know, the grass, you can say the grass is greener. Look at those entrepreneurs. You know, technologies come and go. You got to love what you do. Uh, you have to own your path. Um, you have to, you know, really think about your own trajectory in order to kind of own your life and own your own career. And granted, you're always part of an ecosystem. Uh, you're not necessarily, I'm not advocating necessarily acting like a lone wolf every day because, you know, uh, we do work in ecosystems. But, um, you know, I think it's important to think about, you know, your tra trajectory. This one, educate yourself, again, echoes, you know, what my fellow speakers have said. You know, these, I just, you know, clipped a lot of, um, you know, what I try to do. You absolutely have to stay current. Um, I actually remember, and I'm actually, you know, very good colleagues with this person now, but in my first management job, I had an older man try to intimidate me in a meeting. Um, and he was throwing around very technical language, authenticated VLANs, blah, 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 you know, and I knew enough that he was like being a jerk to me, you know, but I also knew I didn't know what authenticated VLANs were, you know, so what did I do? I went and figured it out, uh, did my research and went back and questioned him on it, you know, so what about these authenticated VLANs and what do you think they, you know, what do you think they need to do? Let, fine, let's talk about it. Let's put it on the table. I'm cool with that. So challenge yourself, you know, continue learning. There is so much great content out there. Identify what you want to learn and just do it. You know, create a learning plan. 
uh, do little experiments. There are such you know low cost, fun social individual experiments. One of the uh, best uh, executive education programs I went to back in 2006, one of the speakers, Andrew McAfee, who talks about Enterprise 2.0, you know, threw out a challenge to the group, just said, start a blog. You know, go to a free, go to blogger.com, it's totally free, and start a blog. What are you going to blog about? And um, I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll do that. You know, and it was a very interesting uh, experiment for me, and it didn't cost me any money, you know, and it was very thought provoking. I got experience doing a blog. I've, you know, since started, you know, different ones. I'm doing one on our, um, on our uh, social enterprise implementation within UMUC, and it's just very interesting. Um, you know, Bill Gates has a very good website. You're all on Facebook, you know, New York Times, you know. These are just um, Flipboard. I love, I evangelize Flipboard. It's a free iPad app. And uh, it's great to, you know, just be able to pull a lot of content from different channels and just kind of flip through. Uh, the teaching company CDs and DVDs that you can check out at the library, excellent resources. Uh, my favorite um, podcast, I have an hour commute each way. And um, I'm like driven to be productive every moment of the day. It's, it's, it's a flaw, but I, it's just, it's how I, I I've, uh, willing, be willing to know yourself. I'll get to that part. Um, the Entrepreneurial Thought Leaders series uh, out of Stanford are excellent. Um, and also Harvard Business Review IdeaCast, uh, very, very good and totally free. All this stuff is free. And, you know, a lot of this stuff is free. Uh, there are very few barriers to entry or barriers to acquire this knowledge. Uh, we are so fortunate to have access, you know, high-speed access, wherever we need to have these devices. Um, you know, take advantage of them. Um, embrace impermanence. This is my HHDL, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Um, a lot of these things are interconnected, and I'll just spend a little bit of time on this. Um, you know, life is a constant state of change. Good things and bad things don't last. Um, you know, we'll, we'll just acknowledge the indisputable premise of that. People come and go, jobs come and go, technologies come and go. You know, the, the, the real opportunity here is, is to stay current. Um, so. I would just say, you know, adjust to change. And ad adaptation is a big theme in technology. I think that's, um, you know, it's huge, just adapting to different industries and different technologies. You know, and again, if you are open to learning and have that habit of learning, um, it shouldn't be scary. Uh, you're all bright, wonderful, capable people that should have a lot of confidence. Um, just do it. You know, actually, one of the uh, anecdotes I wanted to share was uh, when I was doing my master's here. Um, and the end of 19, so fall semester 1998, I started my first management job here at GW. And uh, I was also in my last year. So I was fall semester, spring, sem fall semester 1998, spring semester 1999, and I was going to graduate in May 1999. And I also started my first management job in August 1998. And I had um, not a full course load, but I was taking two courses uh, that fall. And the, my first management job was a, a very steep learning curve, um, as all first management jobs should be. Um, if you don't have a steep learning curve on your first management job, you know, you might want to think about what you're learning and how you're managing. Um, so, uh, uh, so I went to my advisor and I was like, you know, I think I need to reduce my course load, you know, because I'm finding this job very challenging. I want to do it justice, you know, so I would like to readjust my course load and extend the time it's going to take me to get my master's. And he looked at me and he basically said, you can do it, just get through it. And I remember that feeling. I was, I thought for sure he was just going to say, okay, let's, you know, how are we going to schedule it or whatever? And he said, you know what, just, you can do it. So just do it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I did. You know, you can really surprise yourself. And it's kind of like, you know, give a task to a busy person. It's amazing what you can get done. You know, and, 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 and adverse conditions and having a lot on your plate um, actually help you become more efficient in what you do. Um, so it, it goes to the confidence. It goes to, you know, you should just have confidence that you can do it. Um, and know that you will have your own um, stamp on it, and that is totally okay. Um, 
The next one, again, is, is echoing a lot of the points, is mentor up, down, and across. There was a really good article about reverse mentoring. Um, I forget what... Um, what uh, publication it was, you know, but for example, uh, Jack Welch, um, when he was at, I think, GE, right, uh, he uh, invited some younger, younger people to teach him how to use the web, you know, because it was something that he didn't know about. Um, and that's, and when I read through this whole thing, so it's this, this idea of reverse mentoring and it's a two way relationship and, ve and very productive, you know, you should establish learning relationships with people, uh, including people younger than you, you know, your co, you know, peers as well as your seniors. And, and really when I think about it, the real opportunity here is to be a leader that gets it. Because I think in a lot of non-technology environments, executives do not understand their most critical and expensive high profile projects because their careers have mostly happened outside of technology and outside the internet revolution or whatever. You don't wanna be a leader like that when it comes your time. You want to be a leader who gets it. You need to be a leader who uh, does not think hierarchically because uh, you know, that, 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 that 20 year old who dropped out of college or whatever is gonna have some experience that you really need on your team or who could lead an innovation that's gonna make a huge difference for your company. You know, so this traditional hierarchical, because I have X amount of experience, I know more than you, you know, that doesn't really uh, get executives very far when it comes to technology and innovation. You really need to be open up, down, and across. Um, you know, so uh, I've seen, you know, you just, you know, you, you want to be a leader that gets it. Okay. Let's see. Know your moral compass. So it's similar to Google, uh, do no evil, right? Um, you really have to be able to recognize what's going on around you. It's really important, you know, to, yes, you want to drink the Kool-Aid, yes, you want to be part of the ecosystem, uh, but I think it's also important to understand, uh, and again, be your own individual, and understand when things, um, uh, you know, are not to the level of your integrity, um, and be able to recognize that early, um, and act upon that. You know, so that kind of goes to the be your own trajectory, um, you know, and it's it can be an unrewarding path. I mean, you can you all know, you know, cases of whistleblowers who, you know, for these failed corporations, you know, who tried to do the right thing. Um, you know, so I think it's just really very important to uh, know your moral compass. Build your networks. I loved this TED talk by this 12 year old. <laughs> app developer who got on stage with an iPad and talked about developing apps. Um, you know, so this kind of goes up down to, go, goes to being re reverse mentoring and educating yourself. You know, build and maintain your networks. Be open, be active. Um, it's very, very, very important. You need to learn from everybody. Know your environment. You know, my 11-year-old son helped me put this slide together. He doesn't quite realize that this whole helping me with a power, you know, I help him with his PowerPoints. He doesn't quite understand. He doesn't get those same editing uh, authority over my PowerPoints, but I let him do this slide. So the word ecosystem is actually one of my favorite words uh, because it's true. We're, we're very interdependent um, and we all are in ecosystems. And I think it's very important for, um, for, you know, to not just look at yourself or your department in a in a org chart kind of sense, you know, just as just as there is a formal org chart, then there's an informal network that you should establish. You know, be establishing these collaborative, you know, relationships. Um, we're all in large and small ecosystems, so I would just encourage you uh, to kind of take a step back and kind of think about that in terms of your environment and how the ecosystem works. Um, I have been in situations of male dominated environments, you know, where I have thought to myself, you know, I can't, you know, this, you know, I don't even see the game they're playing. Um, 
And, you know, not that I've even wanted to see it, you know, but it just was kind of a, uh, a, it seemed like a very closed environment, you know, but you can, you need to, rather than shut it out, you need to think about, okay, do I want to break into it? You know, do I want to analyze it? How do I, how do I get into it? You know, how you're going to, how you're going to handle it. Um, be not just do. I think that, you know, whether it's a, I think this goes across, you know, males and females, it's not gender specific or generationally specific. Um, a lot of us can get just caught up in doing. Do, 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 do. I've got my list. I've got my fires of the day. I've got my meetings. Just do, 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 do. And that can be a really um, uh, short sighted diet, you know, of things to do. So, you know, I think it's important to also cultivate your humanity um, and not just get caught into um, the doing, 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 um, you know, the, the kind of cultivating the gift of being present to yourself, to your life, to, 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 to others. Um, I love technology. I'm online a lot. I consume enormous amounts, you know, but I also am not an advocate for, you know, techno pervasive technology in the classroom for K through, you know, for, you know, at least K through eighth, um, you know, there's a time and a place for technology, but we are also, you know, human beings that need face-to-face -face interaction. So, you know, let's not forget that. Um, and then the last slide, I would just say, I love, this is Fast Company, and I just love this slide. This, this, I took a picture of this with my new iPhone 4S. It's a two meg, it's a very big picture. Um, you know, I just be willing to know yourself. And when I've when I've been at different crossroads and kind of thought about what I like to do, what I'm interested in doing, I just I love to take risks. You know, I enjoy going into the unknown. Uh, all of my positions, you know, except the early several, were all positions that were newly created to adapt to the technology needs of the organization. You know, these are new positions. We don't know, I don't know what I'm gonna be doing in three years. You know, I don't know if the social enterprise thing will take off, you know, or how it's gonna morph, you know, or how, you know, cloud computing is gonna do X, Y, or Z. You know, I will stay up on the trends, but you know, a lot of what we're going to be going into, we can't even see, cause it's not even invented, right? So, um, uh, so I know about myself that I will always pick the new um, the proposition that has risk and the unknown, there's just something very satisfying about that. I think that technology has been very rewarding. I think it's a, it's a field that I encourage uh, anybody who wants to enter into it to enter into it because you get such broad experience with very, um, very critical uh, projects uh, that have um, a lot of need for money, resources, funding, organization, process, program management, et cetera. And you just get an, an enormous amount of very valuable experience uh, by being in IT. It kind of turbos your career uh, because uh, you see so much. Now, you have to be able to want, you know, you have to be able to drink from the fire hose and want to drink from the fire hose. Um, but I find that it's very, very rewarding. Um, so kind of risk, survive, repeat, risk, survive, repeat is, uh, you know, something that I've recently realized that I like to do. So Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you again to the panel. Can we give them another round of applause? Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, we're going to take just a quick break to sneak out, uh, refresh our drinks, and um, we'll come back in about 10 minutes. So those of you who are watching online, don't go away. And thank you so much. I am not from Illinois. I was at. Oh, are you a Saluki? No, no, I went to Oh, okay. I was stationed there when I was active duty Air Force. Um, completed my undergraduate and then decided at my first assignment there in Illinois. 
pursue my, my graduate degree. So fun stuff. I enjoyed Illinois though. Yeah. <laughs> but I am a Saluki at heart. <laughs> and go Patriots. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Oh wow. Let's see. So I joined the Air Force specifically to go to law school. I didn't even have my eyes on IT. I, of course, I did go after I achieved my undergraduate degree, um, and so I went there, and they had a critical shortage um, for communications comm systems officers. Yes, one is the it's the reverse now. Is it really? Yeah. Are they oversaturated? Oh, they in the Marine Corps they'll still say yeah, like I mean, they have bonus, but okay. they have comm officers. Yeah. So it's like Navy, Air Force. Wow. Incredible. That's incredible. At the time that I joined, they said, we got a critical shortage. And even though I wanted to go to law school, they said, and I applied for the funded legal education program, they said, sorry, can't let you out. We need IT folks. And so I was sort of forced into it. Um, and then, and so I had to separate after five, four years, after two years, or um, so that I could go to law school. Um, Oh, I do, I do, I do. Sorry, go ahead, Patricia. Thank you, thank you. I do. Thank you so much. Super, super good. I'm going to give this one to you, too, Patricia. Are you still in the service? Actually, I was a contractor. Okay. Oh, okay. But now I work for a company called Info Reliance. Okay. I worked in the EPSS program. Okay. Okay, HPSS. Okay, security system. Oh, okay. Okay. That's cool. I was seeing such a matter. I got to go all over the world. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't trade my military experience for anything in the world. Nothing in the world. I mean, I, I got my first introduction as an officer, as a leader. So, you, you know, your folks 